What a privilege to be able to read God's Word. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, we'll be reading verses 22 through 37. Matthew 12, 22. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it, is to, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me, and whoever does not gather with me, scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers! How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasures brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasures brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Pastor George? My wife and I will be uh, heading out, uh, flying down to Tampa later on this afternoon, and we will be back uh, Friday evening. If something arises, you can always call uh, the number in the bulletin for the church. Um, Melanie can get a hold of me, and you could call any of the elders. We practice here what is called plurality of elders. Uh, another name for an elder is an overseer. The Latin term pastor is probably what is most popular today, a pastor. But a pastor is really a shepherd. He cares for people. If he doesn't care for people, he's not a biblical shepherd. So I am so thankful for uh, my fellow shepherds and they'll be able to take care of anything or uh, Melanie will be able to reach me while I'm, uh, my wife and I are out of town. Also, since <clears throat> um, uh, unless I take along a big stack of books, I will take along some. I look forward to reading uh, while we're down there, but lack of uh, preparation time, and so I've asked uh, Dr. Allen Church if he will uh, preach the word. He has done that before for us. He's an excellent expositor of scripture. So pray uh, for Dr. Church as his, isn't that a wonderful name, Dr. Church? I, ju I just love calling you that, Alan. Um, uh, he will bring the word next Sunday morning. And what a passage that he will bring forth, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 has the greatest invitation 
for people to come to God in the entire Old Testament that parallels Matthew 11, 28, and 29. So uh, pray for him and his preparation as well. Then also before I begin this morning, I just want to say a word about the conference uh, yesterday. That was the last one for this year. We will start again in March. We have three times a year over in Fort Worth. And Dr. Lance Quinn was there again. Many of us were praying for Lance Quinn, walked through him that long, uh, several years uh, when his wife was diagnosed with non-smoker's uh, lung cancer. And she went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. Lance is about 10 years younger uh, than I am, still had children in the home. He is such an excellent uh, teacher. But I, I, I bring this up. What he walked us through yesterday was the last in the series, The War Within. So what happened in the century, uh, probably uh, the intertestamental period, there was a great rise in visible demonic activity. It's not that it has never been there, but there was a great rise in it, and you'll see it in the first century as well, what we've been looking through as we walk through the Gospels. One of the reasons for that is, remember John the Baptist when he was put in Macarus, the, the prison, and uh, he was confused. He preached, this is the Messiah, this is the coming one, and the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and judgment is about to fall. And all he heard from his disciples was, Jesus is, is healing, he's casting out demons, but when is judgment going to fall? And so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus. I remember the, the response. He said, go tell John the lame are healed. Lepers are cleansed. Demons are cast out. The blind can see. In other words, these things are a confirmation of the Old Testament that points forward to the Messiah. If he doesn't do these things, then you can count on him. He is not the Messiah. We see also visible manifestations of demonic activity in the acts, um, which is really um, the acts of the Spirit done through the apostles. By the time we get to end of Acts in, uh, and we start to hit the New Testament epistles, you do not see and hear about to the degree that you would have in the Gospels of visible demonic activity. But don't think that they have resigned or they are no longer active, and that's what Dr. Quinn worked us through yesterday. Started in Romans, went all the way through Revelation, and looked at there is a real spiritual war going on today. I don't always see it, but it is there, and it is intense. I don't get up every morning and think about, I'm engaged in the spiritual warfare, but we are. We are. So as we come to the passage this morning, we are still in a period in history where Jesus is healing, healing the blind, healing the lame. All who came to him, he healed without exception. And he cast out demons. And then we will come to the text this morning that has caused many people dismay. Is there such a sin that you can commit while you are here upon earth and it will not be forgiven you? I know one person in particular, he uh, had uh, engaged in homosexual activity and he was told that you have committed the unpardonable sin and you will never be forgiven you. I go, well, that, no, you're not reading all of Scripture because it says 
such were some of you. And then we know uh, people that have come down to the very end of their lives have been hardened uh, and unrepentant, and even at the end of their lives, some have uh, turned to Christ. Uh, my good friend Wilford Webb that occasionally fills the pulpit here, we were at Believer's Chapel at the time, and Wilford was teaching, and we were told he wouldn't be in that morning. He had spent the night at the hospital with his brother who was dying of AIDS. He was, he was a uh, homosexual and had totally refused to repent, and uh, Wilford had spent the night with him. Then I learned from Wilford, somewhere in those final hours before he passed into eternity, his brother softened his heart and ask God to forgive him. Some discount those kind of uh, accounts. I do not. There was the thief on the cross. There were two criminals there on both sides of Jesus who was being crucified. And if you read the Markin account, they were both mocking him, reviling him. And then one turned to the other criminal and said to him, you know what, we're getting what we justly deserve. But this man, this man has done nothing. And he had a recognition there in his final breath that this man was different and had a full recognition that he was the savior of sinners. And he said, remember me, remember me. And Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. The Bible is clear. If you pass from this life, Without Jesus Christ, there is no second chance or third chance or fourth chance. And that's the urgency of believing upon Jesus Christ now. You pass from this life, uh, the word eternal damnation, apolia. It's very real, and so there is an urgency every time someone hears the gospel. Don't, don't delay. You don't know. Your life is but a vapor. It could end this afternoon. Jesus may come again, and you do not want to be found without him. So I admonish you, even this morning, if you are apart from Jesus Christ as we, and we go through the gospel, believe upon him, turn to him, and embrace the Savior. So you say you still haven't answered the question, is there such a thing as an unpardonable sin that we can commit here while we are still present upon planet Earth? And I will submit to you that that's, that is exactly what the text says this morning. And we will look at, it's been all over the map in Christian history, how people have understood this particular sin, we will take uh, a look at it, and I will give you uh, my understanding uh, of what this is, and hopefully you can see it from the text. Lord God, thank you for mercy and grace. Where would we be without a God of grace and mercy? I have no idea how many sins I have committed in my life. But all those who call upon you and cry out, oh God, just like the thief on the cross, look to you for forgiveness. You grant it generously. And hand in hand with that true call is a call of repentance, turning from sin. So Lord, help us to be a people who embrace the true gospel that has bad news behind it, guilty sinners. And guilty sinners who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from their sinful ways, you reject no one. We're thankful for that. Give clarity this morning. Help me to be very careful with this text uh, to bring glory and honor 
to your name, and may, may it be a great warning to us. Do not harden your heart. As J.R. read from the scriptures this morning, do not harden your heart, but turn to him. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. whoever was working the booth, and I was standing on it and just ripped it right apart. So, um. All right, back to uh, the title here uh, is, uh, to me, uh, key to understanding this particular, what is called in the text, that there will be no forgiveness granted. I ask the question, is it a single act or is it an implacable attitude that has over time rejected over and over and over again the truth of the Word of God so that you could come to the place in this life, in this life, that you don't really want to repent? So it's not that God is unwilling to forgive, but you so harden your heart that From that point on, why isn't it forgiven? Well, the person doesn't want to repent of sin. Now, it's also very important when we look at this why we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And three of them uh, record this, what is called the unpardonable sin. And if we just go to one of them and don't look at all three, I think we might come away a bit skewed on this. So I'm going to begin, first of all, looking at some of the interpretations of the unpardonable sin in the history of the church, and then I'm going to work through uh, briefly these passages, how they describe this, and Luke in particular is a little bit different. And then I'm also going to go to Hebrews chapter 6 and also My understanding there is that is exactly the same kind of hardened sin that can happen. So, in we go. I'll start with probably the earliest in church history is uh, the Didache. The Didache means uh, teaching, the teaching of the of the twelve or the twelve apostles, um, symbol dated around the beginning of the second century, no later than a. Uh, A.D. 150, and there we read in section 11.7, it says, Do not test or evaluate any true prophet through whom a spirit is giving instruction. In other words, if you have a genuine prophet of God and he is speaking to the spirit and you evaluate and you reject it, here's what it says, every sin will be forgiven but this sin will not be forgiven. So early on, we already see that it was uh, understood to be a denial of prophetic inspiration. I do not see that that is found in the text. In Irenaeus, in the second century, um, perhaps overzealous, um, trying to admonish people to repent, the urgency of repentance, And not only Irenaeus, but others would say, look, if you don't respond to the gospel right now, you are committing the unpardonable sin. You don't find that in Scripture. Uh, We'll look at the specifications of it. 
origin, uh, third century in parallel with 1 John 5, 16, uh, origin held that it was a post-conversion uh, apostasy. Um, in his De Principis, or, or First uh, Principles, uh, he writes that uh, if a person has received forgiveness and then by his very act and work um, apostatizes from that, then he is guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Of course, um, that implies that one can lose your salvation. Uh, I do not hold that at all. And I think it's uh, wrong to tell, you, you want to, I, I want to urge you, every unbeliever, respond now. Respond now. You, you have no assurance that you'll have another life breath. But to bring in a wrong conclusion is unbiblical. Some have held that it's uh, a falling away under persecution. Remember what happened when, especially in addition, intense persecution happened. And many who profess faith, um, they abandon that profession to save their skin. But it would also be, then it's called the lapsed. They lapsed into uh, a, a denial. They denied their profession of faith. Then after uh, Constantine came and the persecution wasn't intense, they wanted to be permitted back into the church. And so you had this whole, in church history, the controversy of the lapse. Should we let them back? Were they really true believers uh, or, or not? Um, uh, Augustine, I think, is close, but he refers it to unrepentant unbelief in general. Um, it's much more specific when we look at that. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has always held that suicide is a mortal sin. In other words, if you take your own life, uh, you, you, uh, that, you, you could never uh, be saved. They have revised that. Uh, somewhat, if you look at the Baltimore uh, Catechism, they would put some uh, nuance that a little bit better. And then some say it's the Beelzebul controversy. In other words, it can only be something that was committed in the first century by the Pharisees, historically. They saw the very acts of Jesus. They couldn't deny the miraculous and so they ascribed it to Satan. And since we don't, we're not able to visibly see those miracles, some hold that that sin can't be repeated today. Um, and then there is where I stand is what's called an intense, obstinate rejection of Jesus Christ that can be committed again by repeatedly hardening your heart against the clear truths of the Word of God. There may come a day in your life you have so hardened your heart that you will not, you will not turn to the Savior. If you think you have committed the unpardonable sin, you probably have not, as we will see from because... Uh, what's clear from the text is people who have committed an unpardonable sin, they don't care. They could care less. They could care less about repentance. So if you are concerned about sins in your life, the text is still clear. Turn to the Savior and He will forgive you. So let's walk through this um, and um, looking at the different uh, passages Every sin, this is the one from Matthew this morning, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Parallel to that, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And this why 
this one, either in this age or in the age to come. So you can commit a sin in this age called the unpardonable sin, and you will not be forgiven while you are on planet Earth. This is some serious stuff. Now let's look at how Mark does in his parallel. And before the preceding one, notice that Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, note 1224. Here, uh, Mark has him speaking to the scribes, uh, whether scribes and Pharisees, he's speaking to both of them. And he says, amen. It starts out this way, truly, truly, this, this is a very serious statement. I say to you, says Jesus, and it's a you plural, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, mankind. Even the blasphemies they may speak. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit does not have forgiveness, and it's the word, I only have, eternal, forever, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And then finally, looking at the Lucan passage, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So there was that crucial text, either in this age or the one to come. And then also, I would add theologically a parallel out of Hebrews chapter 6 in the case of these people. Five things are true, and it's the same category. There is uh, an, a plural article there in Greek, and it governs all these. So some translate, and if they have fallen away. No, you can't translate it if, it's then. So they have been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the good word of God and miracles of the coming age and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now, this is one of the key texts if you uh, believe you can lose your salvation that many will go to. Say, well, if they repented, they had to be truly children. No, there is a category in the Bible for a false repentance. Remember John the Baptist? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Don't just say you've repented. You need to show it by your actions. And uh, all of these things um, can be true uh, of an unbeliever. So I see this as also a parallel here. Now, boy, okay, I'm going to have to step on the gas pedal. So what I want to do is show that there are events leading up to this unforgivable sin. In other words, is it possible for a person, while they are planet Earth, to so harden their hearts that they will never repent? And how would you know if you are that person? So I, I <coughs> remember... When John, when John was out there baptizing by the Jordan, John the baptizer, and the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him, remember what he did? Hey, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you brood of vipers? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And then we see a summary of Jesus healing every disease without exception, uh, casting out. This is right before the Sermon on the Mount. Then we go to the Sermon on the Mount. And this would have been offensive to the scribes and Pharisees. He tells everyone, look, if you don't have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, it's very emphatic. You'll never see heaven. You'll never see heaven. And if you want to know what that righteousness looks like that exceeds the scribe and the Pharisees, just read the rest of the Sermon on Mount. It's deal with the heart. In other words, they were focused on the external act. And Jesus went a whole lot deeper, starts in the heart. In other words, there is such a thing as adultery in the heart without ever committing the physical act. There is such a thing as murder in the heart without actually committing physical murder. 
So all of those things Jesus said, look, the heart is the heart of the problem. And if your heart is not cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then you don't have a righteousness uh, that's going to get you into heaven. And then we look at immediately after the Sermon on the Mount, and he comes down, and what do we see? Oh, just healing after healing, casting out demons. Remember the first one? It's so striking to me in chapter 8, 1. It says, Jesus finished these words, and all of a sudden, here comes an unclean leper running down the mountain, and I'm sure he was trying, unclean, unclean, and all the crowds are around him, and they're, what is, what is this unclean leper doing? And he comes right up to Jesus and says, if you are willing, if you are willing, you can heal me. And Jesus reached out his hand, and he touched him. What would that touch do? Well, it would defile you unless you are the Messianic, the Messiah, the one, and the same touch that t- touched him, cleansed him. And then we come down to 813, the centurion's servant from a distance. Remember, here, here's a man, a hecantarch, ruler over 100 people. He knows what it is to have authority. You look at the mark in parallel, and he's sending his servants up there, and they say, hey, this is, this is a good Gentile. He even built a synagogue for us. We, we would like you to do this for him and to heal his little pice, his pitas. He has a servant in his home that's just about ready to die. And so um, we see that the, the centurion never even got all the way to Jesus. He met with his, his servants who were coming back. And he said, Here, here's what I want you to tell Jesus. I know what it is to command men. And who are under my authority. All you have to do is say a word. Say a word. You don't even have to be present, and he'll be healed. And he was. Healing from a distance. And you don't think that this word got out? I mean, masses. Why were they bringing all of the people to him? Because this isn't quackery. This is the real deal. And then... 816, all were healed. Remember the two Gadarene demoniacs? What an account that is. And so they get off the boat on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and here comes two demoniacs. No one could overpower them, and they think they're going to pounce on Jesus and uh, the disciples with them, and all of a sudden they get a surprise. And they know who he is. And why have you come to torment us before our time? And these were men. No one could tame them. No one could subdue them. They're running around naked, wild. They lack what is called sobriety of mind. And Jesus, not that he didn't know, but he's helping us to understand. What's your name? They said, Legion. Legion. Permit us to go into these swine. And what happened? A herd of about 2,000 swine. Jesus permitted it. They rushed down what's called Kersey into the cliff, into the Sea of Galilee, and those pigs perished. What a glimpse that I cannot see with the visible eye what's going on in the spiritual realm. And Remember what he told the one demoniac? Now he's sitting clothed in his right mind. He wanted to go with Jesus. No, no, you go back and you tell your people what great things God has done for you. Look, this is getting out. These aren't hidden under a bushel, these healings, what what is taking place. And notice when Jesus goes into the synagogues, what does he do? He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And what kind of gospel did he proclaim repent and believe in him and then the paralytic lowered through the roof remember the the scribes and pharisees were sitting around and uh all i prayed this morning when i read through that passage make me that kind of a person lord god that i whatever i need to do to bring people to jesus 
that I would do that, make me that kind of a friend. They show up, the house is jam-packed with a crowd around it, so they go up on that flat roof, and what do they do? They cut a hole in there, and they lower the man down through. That must have been a sight, and the scribes are sitting around, want to catch Jesus, trick him up or something, and... Uh, the first thing he says to that man instead of healing is your sins are forgiven. And then we have that great statement. In order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority upon earth to forgive sins, get up, take your pallet, and head out the door. And off he went. And what was the response? You see, why I'm doing this, there is a sequential hardening of heart on the part of the Pharisees. And what did they do? This man blasphemes. This man blasphemes. Uh, Matthew's banquet for, for friends. Matthew, the despised tax collector. Jesus, come follow me. Come follow me. And what did he do? He followed him. And one of the first things that we see in evidence of the work of grace of God in his life hey, all my fellow despised tax collectors, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw. The biggest banquet you have ever seen, and all you sinners, you come. He must have had a, a large house in the first century, and they came, and who's the guest of honor? Jesus and his disciples. And the Pharisees are going, what? He's a glutton and a drunkard. He eats and fellowships with tax collectors. And what did Jesus say? Look, I didn't come to call the righteous, the self-righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. And what message are they getting? They're critical of the whole thing. You see what's happening? Why I'm walking through this? There is hardening of the heart. Hardening of the heart. Hardening of the heart. There's rejection of truth. Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, now the ruler of the synagogue, he comes to Jesus, he falls down before him, and he's worshiping, and he says, look, my dear 12-year-old daughter, she is at the point of dying. Would you please come? And so Jesus heads out. He's going to go down, and he's going to restore his little daughter. And all of a sudden, a divine interruption. Well, it didn't seem like to Jairus it was a divine interruption. Here comes a woman. The crowds are pressing around him, and some woman comes up behind him and grabs a hold. I take it as the little tassel hanging down on his robe. And she was healed. And Jesus turns around and says, who healed me? Only a liberal would look at Scripture and say Jesus didn't know. What he's doing, he's drawing out a profession of faith from her. And she did. And then he heads down to heal Jairus' daughter. And he gets down there and they say, too late, too late. <laughs> he puts everybody out except for a couple of his disciples and the father and the mother, and he goes in, and he takes the little girl by the hand, Talitha Kuma, and she gets up, and he says, give her some food to eat. These things aren't done in darkness. They're done, evident for everyone to have. And then you have this warning. Woes, woe to you if you don't repent. Judgment upon Chorazin, Bethsaida, uh, Capernaum, because of the massive amount of light and truth you have. If you do not repent, it'll be worse for you than for them. And the imperatives, come to me, come to me. You'll find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. And what happened? There's no response among the Pharisees. What's the first thing they do? They pop up. I, no. There they are in a grain field on the Sabbath. Jesus is walking through with his disciples, and they pop up, and they see his disciples just plucking grain off the top and, and eating it. And you're, you're, no, you're, your disciples and you're responsible for them are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Do you see this rejection of truth has been building and building and building? And so Jesus gives them two examples from Scripture. Have you not read? Have you not read? And uh, what's their answer? 
Well, their answer was, now we're in a synagogue. There's no repentance. And so now they're watching. They're watching him. I take it the man with the withered hand probably was a plant. And they knew he was in there, and they're watching him. Is he going to do this? Is he going to do this on a Sabbath? This is against their traditions. It's not against God's word. And so what happens? Tells the man to stand up. Stands up. Everybody can see his withered hand. And what happened? He made it whole instantaneously, just like the other one. So how do you respond to that? Well, they went out. It says they were filled with rage. And they went out and had strange bed partners with them, the Herodians, who weren't in theological agreement, but both of them wanted to do away with Jesus. So I do this to say truth has been rejected. It's been rejected. It's been rejected. It's been rejected. Now we come to the text here then in Matthew and the historical event igniting the allegation against Jesus. So turn with me then if you don't have your Bible open. So a demon oppressed man who was blind, I'm in verse 22, was blind and mute, was brought to him. We've seen muteness before, can't speak. We've seen blindness, but now we also have demon oppression. And Jesus healed him. And the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? We've seen that term before. The son of David is a term uh, clearly for Messiah. Remember how the genealogy starts and then... Uh, he's, he's the son of David. And the question here in, in Greek, it can do one of two things. It can say the answer, sometimes it'll apply the answer, oh, certainly not. But sometimes it Im- just implies doubt. And that's what's happening here. They're, they're wondering, could this man possibly be the son of David? Is this really the Messiah, this person who is doing these uh, things? I, I think... Uh, Nicodemus, remember the Pharisee? He came to Jesus and he goes, you must be a teacher from God, a ruler from God. No one can do these types of things except he come from God. And Jesus didn't say to Nicodemus, bright young Cambridge professor of theology or whatever you want to call him. He goes, unless you are born again, unless you're born again, I know then, both from above and anew. You can't see the kid. You can't see it. You can't enter it. Something has to take place there. So here we are, and this is the historical event that takes place. Now, Matthew doesn't dwell on it. He doesn't spend a lot of time on it because that's not what he really wants us to see is how the Pharisees react to this. Now, remember, the Pharisees are the group that are rigorous in their literal understanding of the Old Testament, but they miss the main point, which is the heart. And so they heard it. And can this man be the son of David? Notice they already, back in verse 14, they have already made up their minds to murder him. You know, so they're, they're, they're concerned about him violating their traditions, but they have no qualms about committing murder in the heart, violating the commandments of God. And they say it's only by Beelzebub, which is clearly here, the prince or the ruler of demons, that this man cast out demons. Whoa. Now we have a very serious allegation. It's not the first time that they have said this, but now there's a repeated hardening of the heart. And they have an alarm at the reaction of the crowd. They acknowledge the reality of the exorcism, but they attribute the power to Satan, not to God.
And Jesus responds in three ways. The first are arguments, and then the third one will be we will hit the unpardonable sin. So the first response, and it's to, he asked them two questions. And the first question, it, it just, look, what you're saying is absurd. How could that be? Um, and, and here it is. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. It's going to be destroyed. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Second question. And there were uh, Jewish exorcists, and we saw some false ones. Remember the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts? And uh, the demon said, Paul, I know, <laughs> but I don't know you. And uh, they all leaped on him and beat him to a pulp there. But there were Jewish exorcists. And Jesus says, okay, then if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, as that's the only way exorcisms take place, um, what about your own sons? That, that means sons, not literal sons, but sons of that kind of, of thinking. And who do they cast them out? They're going to be your judges for what you just said. But here it is, verse 29. And he asserts the real explanation. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, this is, this is a statement, I think, the clearest statement in the Gospels for the presence of the kingdom of God now in the person of Jesus. The king is here. He is present, and his power is present. He's forgiving sins. Tax collectors and harlots are entering the kingdom of God before you, Jesus said. But some will then say, well, then there is no future aspect of the kingdom. I say, no. There is a very real presence of the kingdom. You, and this is Colossians. He has transferred you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you into the kingdom of his own dear son. But I also understand that the great uh, prophetic passages that speak of a... Uh, Jesus' return to the Mount of Olives, um, those great passages of the, the curse will be lifted, I do take that that is still taking place. So it's like in all of theology, sometimes uh, you can go already not yet. It's already here, but it's not yet here in its full final consummation. And he's warning them. And he says, how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. So in terms of the kingdom, that's what Jesus is already doing in his power, in his presence. And whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And here it is. Therefore, I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, the sons of men, just people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. What contextually is this blasphemy of the Spirit? It is actually you cannot deny what Jesus is doing. They just saw it. They saw it repeatedly, but their only option when the people start saying, could this be the son of David? Their answer is, Satan's at work in his heart and his life. That's by, and you are ascribing the power of Jesus performing miracles by the work of the Spirit to Satan. And that is contextually what is indicated here. That's why I do have a certain affinity towards those who say, well, the Pharisees could have committed that right then. Yes, that's true. But is it something more than that? And then we see another clarification. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit 
will not be forgiven, here it is, either in this age or the age to come. So there's a clarification by negation, what it is. So people commit all kinds of sin, blasphemy, and it's forgiven them. But be very careful about, although we don't have the visible Christ doing this before our very eyes, this is Scripture. This is Scripture. So to take that same hardening attitude against the Word of God and thus the God of the Word. Be very careful about possibly coming to a place in your life that you are so hardened against the Word of God you have no desire to repent. Herman Bavink is a, a Dutch uh, theologian and so I included uh, uh, a condensment of some of his work. He says, it's a sin against the gospel in its clearest revelation. It consists not in doubting or in simply denying the truth, but in a denial that goes against the conviction of the intellect, against the enlightenment of the conscience, against the dictates of the heart in a conscious, willful, and intentional imputation to the influence and working of Satan of that which is clearly, misspelled by me, recognized as God's work. Although God's grace is not too small and too powerless for it, yet in the kingdom of sin there are laws and ordinances placed there by God and maintained by Him. And this law, in the case of this particular sin, is of such a nature that it excludes all repentance cauterizes the conscience, obdurates and hardens the sinner once for all, and in this way makes his sin unpardonable. And he can't blame God for it. He is fully guilty for hardening his heart. Some blaspheme Christ, but then repent. But those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit by attributing his work and witness to Satan, according to this text, are damned. This blasphemy is not so much a matter of blasphemous language, but of a conscious, persistent, wicked rejection of the Spirit's witness. It is a setting of the mind against the Spirit of God. It is a persistent and decisive, obstinate, stubborn rejection of the Spirit's message and work concerning Jesus. Speech is singled out because it reflects an attitude, a confession of the heart. It's not the utterance that is key, but is what the utterance reveals about the heart, a permanent, settled decision of rejection. For those who fear that they may have committed the unpardonable sin, J.C. Ryle rightly remarks, there is such a thing as a sin which is never forgiven, but those who are troubled about it are most unlikely to have committed it. Those who actually do commit the sin are so dominated by evil and hardness of heart that they do not desire to repent. And so I say to you this morning, I'm not God. I can't see the heart. I don't know when someone may have come to that point of obstinate rejection of truth. I look at examples in Scripture. Paul was a blasphemer, and he got a little shock on the road to Damascus and became the great apostle and wrote a large section of the New Testament, you can blaspheme Christ. It's a heinous sin. But what is being pointed out here is, I can tell you this morning, if you have not believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, what Scripture says, do not harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. 
Trust in him. Turn from your sin. Take his yoke upon you. Learn from him. He's not a harsh taskmaster. Look, when you come to two, two gates, you're already on one if you haven't trusted in Christ. You're on the Broadway. You know where that leads? To destruction, and many are those who find it. But then you come to the narrow gate. You know what? You don't get through that gate keeping your sin. You have to discard it through repentance. And the way is difficult on that road. It's not easy. But Jesus' yoke is light. And the burdens and the difficulties of life, he will guide us through. He will be our companion. He will help us, and he will guide us. And it leads to life, and he'll get us home. Trust in him. Trust in him. You say, well, I don't want to trust in him. I pray for people that have hardened their heart. I don't know. It's become to an obstinate point whether because I'm not God. I don't know if they ever will, but I know what I admonish them to do. Look, turn to him. Repent of him. This is serious stuff. Don't play games with God. Turn to him. Believe upon Jesus Christ. Trust him. Look at the whole history of sinners that have been forgiven. And you got one standing in front of you. If the first time I heard the gospel then I was damned for not believing it. I couldn't be here. How many times did I hear the gospel growing up and then God graciously turned on the light and I heard it differently? I heard it differently as a lost person. Take sin seriously. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he will forgive your sin. The whole point of the text is here, do not. Harden your heart. And if you have believed upon him, and justification takes place, God declares you righteous through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Look, you can't get it in a better position. If you got the righteousness of Christ assigned to you, both his righteous life and his righteous death, you're good. <laughs> Not in yourself but you're good in Jesus Christ. And if that takes place, it's a momentary act of God when he declares you righteous. And glorification is coming. It's a momentary act when he will take and resurrect that body and unite it if we've already died, a spirit being, unite them too. But between those two points is what is called progressive sanctification. If there is no progressive sanctification taking place in your life, you have no desire for the Word of God. You have Sin is just casual to you. The only thing you're concerned about sin is temporal consequences. No, there must be fruits worthy of repentance. He will get us home. He will get us home. Jerry, come lead us in our final hymn.